Hi, I'm Konstantin Baum, Master of Wine and the Machines are coming for all of us. Ever since ChatGPT was launched for public use, people are running around screaming, tearing their hair out because artificial intelligence is going to change our lives. I myself wasn't too scared because which computer would ever be able to do this tough job sitting around tasting wine all day? However, I was recently contacted by one of my subscribers who challenged me to a tasting battle because he has developed an AI wine taster. So will the machine beat the master or not? We'll find out. Artificial intelligence or machine learning are the buzzwords of the year already and people are wondering how this new technology will change the way we work, communicate and live our lives. I'm one of the over 100 million active users on ChatGPT. It appears to be the leading AI platform at the moment and it can produce really interesting results even though it sometimes makes mistakes. Konstantin Baum, Master of Wine, is a wine educator, consultant and Master of Wine based in Germany. On his YouTube channel, he shares his expertise on wine by producing educational videos. I asked ChatGPT to explain what my channel is about, and the results were really interesting. There were some mistakes there. I don't really interview winemakers on this channel, but the results were flattering enough so that I accept some errors. ChatGPT can also write pretty good tasting notes. It obviously doesn't taste the wine. Instead, it searches the net for information on that wine and then it builds a note based on patterns that it has been trained on. As an AI language model, I don't have personal taste preferences and I don't have access to the latest sensory data to evaluate the quality of wine. At least it's more honest than most tasters about its tasting ability. But as you can see in the example, it gets things wrong. The 2004 Petrus never scored 96 points on robertparker.com and the words it quotes to describe the wine do not appear on the website. Nevertheless, this is interesting technology and when Rudolf Zillen contacted me about his AI wine taster, I was all ears. His system is supposed to produce objective, neutral, unbiased tasting notes, so it doesn't really tell you whether a wine is good or bad. That's really up to you. It works different to ChatGPT because a sample of the wine is also being analyzed and the information on alcohol levels, acidity and sugar are being used in order to improve the results. So I tasted some wines a few weeks ago and then sent the samples to a lab in Sweden and I just received the results. But first of all, let Konstantin from the past explain to you what exactly happened. This is Konstantin from the past talking to you. I've set up the blind tasting already. I don't really know whether I should do it blind, but anyways, I'm just going to do it blind. I've poured all four wines using the Cora Vin because I want to be able to retaste the wines when I get the results from the lab. A bottle of wine from each of these bottles will be sent to the lab for analysis and for well, creating the AI response to the wine. And I think now I'm just going to taste them. Wine one has a pale yellow color with a slight touch of green. On the nose, it's super aromatic. There's quite a lot of gooseberry, some cassis, some yeah, passion fruit flavors coming through, which points me pretty much directly to Sauvignon Blanc. On the palate, it's actually quite rich, with good freshness, but not a very pronounced acidity. I think this tastes like German Sauvignon Blanc. And well, I'd be in like Rheinhessen or the Pfalz with this wine. It's quite a well-made wine. It's not extraordinary, but it's pretty good. So let's check whether I'm right. So this is wine number one. It was under screw cap. So that's why there's a Cora Vin capsule on top and it is the Sauvignon Blanc from the Falz 2021 vintage, 12% of alcohol. Pretty good wine. Let's move on. So wine number two is quite a bit darker in color. It's a little bit more golden tinge. There are a few cork pieces floating around in the glass. I don't know how that happened through the Corava, 
But yeah, it's a little bit more profound in color. On the nose, it's actually far less aromatic. So there's more notes of ripe apple, a little bit of lemon. But there's not this exotic, expressive fruit that one, one brought to the table. On the palate, it's actually quite rich and concentrated. There's a bit more alcohol there, I think. So I'd say this is probably around 13.5% of alcohol. And the acidity is not too pronounced, which kind of points me to a warmer region. Not a hot region, but a, but a warmer region. For me, this smells of Weissburgunder, Pinot Blanc, Silvana. It could also be Chardonnay, for example. But I'm more torn between Pinot Blanc and Silvana. But on the palate, this concentration and richness is more consistent with Weissburgunder. And I'd say it's probably from a warmer area in a cool region like Germany. I actually don't think it's as good as the previous one. I think it's a little bit, well, it's a little bit too made. There's also some banana flavor coming through. It doesn't necessarily appeal to me too much. But anyways, let's check what, what it actually is. Damn, <laughs> I forgot about Grüner Veltliner. This is Grüner Veltliner which, well, I at least sometimes throw in the same bucket as Silvana and Weissburgunder. It's not super aromatic. It can be quite concentrated. And this is exa exactly that. So there's quite a bit of concentration there. It's actually 14.5% of alcohol. So it's very rich and big. And, well, for me, that's just a little bit too much. So wine three has a dark purple core. It gets a little lighter to the rim, but it's quite concentrated and rich in terms of color. On the nose, it smells of blackberries, blueberries. There's also a little bit of pepperiness coming through, little rusticity. So there's also some herbaceous notes, some flavors of black tea. On the palate, it's actually quite intense. The, the tannins are grippy, quite a lot of body there. I would say maybe 14% of alcohol. The acidity is rather low. And well, all in all, it's a pretty good wine. I would actually go straight for Syrah here, I think. This combination of ripe fruit flavors and the black peppery notes coming through really remind me of the profile of Syrah. Not necessarily from France, from the Rhone, where it's, where it's basically at home. I would actually go for South Africa here. It definitely has quite a lot of bite and grip. And I feel like uh, Syrahs from South Africa tend to be a little bit more structured. Let's check. All right. It is Syrah from South Africa, and I got a South African wine, right? So that needs to go down in the history books. It's from Moulineux, a very famous producer in Swartland in South Africa. It's 13.5% of alcohol, and, well, it's, it's, it's a pretty good wine. It actually says five on the back, but this is wine four. I still haven't found my bag number four. And this wine is actually pretty light in color. I can kind of see my hands through it. So it's a, yeah, it's a light purple color. On the nose, it smells of ripe cherries, a little bit of strawberries. And there's also some black tea component coming through. On the palate, it's actually quite juicy, refreshing, fine tannins, but they are not very pronounced. So they are more like low to medium. And, well, the finish is fresh and lively. For me, this smells and tastes very much of the old world. Could be Dolcetto or maybe Barbera. Barbera tends to bring quite a lot of cherry fruit flavor. Dolcetto tends to be a little bit rounder. And this has quite a bit of acidity. So I'm going, this is a Barbera. A pretty good one, but not a great one for sure. It's more well, of an entry-level, fresh and fruity style. The alcohol here, I would say, is also around 13 and a half. And let's see what it is. Damn, it's Lange Nebbiolo. So, well, I'm not completely wrong, but I'm also not really right. But now let's see how the machine did. Look out! So let's have a look at what the machine actually tells us about these wines. These results were not tampered with as far as I understand. So it's basically just data in and then results out by the AI wine taster. 
So, well, let's see what it came up with. So I'm starting off with the Sauvignon Blanc from the files. We locked in all of the data, what grape variety it was, how it was made, all that was entered by Rudolf. And then the expected aromas that came out that the machine told us were basically citrus, gooseberry, green apples, blackcurrant leaves, nettles, and asparagus. Pretty obvious results for Sauvignon Blanc, so it doesn't necessarily take a super intelligent machine to tell us that. It also told us some things about the taste perception. The wine has some taste of sweetness. Fullness is not apparent in this wine. Light-bodied fruit aromas and tastes are clearly noticed. The wine feels soft, but with some hints of bitterness. The wine will have a long shelf life, probably at least 10 years. I think that doesn't really make a lot of sense. I wouldn't say that this Sauvignon Blanc should be aged for 10 years. Maybe it could survive this long, but this is really a wine made for immediate consumption. The results for the Grüner are pretty similar. It lists off a whole range of different flavors that you often find in Grüner Feldlina. And it also says that the shelf life is at least 10 years. I think this is also not a wine that is supposed to be aged this long. I mean, Maybe a little bit longer than the Sauvignon Blanc, but not 10 years. But then again, shelf life and maturity window are not the same thing. But most wines don't go bad. So there's no point in kind of putting a best before date onto it. But yeah, it will survive the next 10 years. It's probably not a wine that you should age for 10 years. So the next wine was the Malineux Syrah. And it was a really good Syrah, I thought. Um, well, flavor-wise, again, you can find all of the Syrah flavors listed here. And on top of that, you get some notes on the aging in barrel because the wine was aged in barrel, but the machine knew that beforehand, so it doesn't take a genius to put in oak and vanilla flavor. Um, but when it comes to the body and the fruitiness, the astringency, the sweetness, all that makes sense. The sweetness is very low at 2 out of 100, but the sugar content is also at 0 0.8 according to the analysis. So that makes a lot of sense. The system again tells us that the shelf life is 10 years. And in this case, I think it's actually right, but I kind of get the feeling that it always tells us that a wine has a shelf life of 10 years. But let's see what it said about the next wine. So for the Nebbiolo, it actually lists some flavors that I find a little bit odd. I mean, there's cherry, raspberry, rose hip, rose, violet, all those flavors that you often find in Nebbiolo. White pepper, not necessarily, but well, anyways. The body, the fruitiness, the astringency are pretty much spot on and the sweetness at two makes a lot of sense because it only has 0 0.2 grams of sugar per liter. And yeah, it only has 20 milligrams of sulfites per liter, which is fairly low for a not natural wine, I would say. The description of the taste makes sense mostly. The taste will be rather dry for sure. Fullness is not clearly noticeable. Light bodied wine. I don't really understand how it comes up with that conclusion because this is a 14% alcohol wine and it actually knows that because the, this kind of data was entered into the system. Um, the tenants are clearly detectable on the palate for sure and the shelf life is again 10 years. So am I worried about my job after this session? Not really. I think when people want to learn about wine, they really want to learn about wine from another person. So I don't think anyone will ever kind of think, well, I want to know what ChatGPT thinks about this wine. However, I think this could improve the quality of information that is available out there. It obviously has to be checked and edited in order to make sure that there is not wrong information in circulation. But this could, for example, work in a supermarket where they don't necessarily have a wine expert on staff, but they could gather quite a lot of information from these documents in order to train their staff to improve the quality of the information on the shelves or maybe on their websites. It could also serve as a basis of information for copywriters who write about wine. But apart from that, I don't think it serves a lot of purposes yet. It's in the name machine learning. So as the machine learns more and more, it will improve its results. So I think we're still pretty much early days. And at some point, this could be maybe something that you could just pick up and put on your website as a description of a wine. But then again, I wouldn't necessarily 
want that. I wouldn't necessarily like someone who sells wine to use a machine to create tasting notes, but maybe that's just me. I want to thank Rudolf for helping me putting together this video. I've linked up his website in the description and I added some information on him. So check that out if you want to learn more. So thank you for watching. If you like this video, then please like it down here. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. The question of the day is, is there a future for AI in wine? What do you think? Let me know down below in the comments. I hope I see you guys again soon. Until then, stay thirsty.